If you want to grab your Bible, we're going to be, the, the larger section that we're going to be taking a look at this morning is going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 7. But what we're going to kind of do is kind of journey throughout the whole Old Testament this morning. Uh, kind of as we saw in the video there, uh, you know, the, the song's entitled, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Um, and that is most certainly true uh, from uh, the Old Testament point of view. And uh, that's kind of what we're going to be looking at here this morning as as. Uh, We look at these people uh, hoping for the advent of hope. And uh, uh, something that we're probably all wrestling with right now uh, with this current pandemic and asking the question, you know, when will this end? When will things kind of become normal? Uh, I'm going to ask this question. How much do you like to wait for things? Um, If you're anything like me, you don't like waiting for things at all. Uh, and especially in our current climate, waiting for things to go back to normal, waiting to see these pews full again, waiting to see people here, uh, venturing out safely with, without the threat of getting sick or anything like that. You know, it's, it's starting to become very tiresome and getting a little sick and tired of waiting. But in general, I, uh, for myself, don't like to wait uh, when I go to Cedar Point, I hate the long lines, even though I love the rides, so it's kind of a necessary evil. Um, uh, you know, when vacation is just, you know, a few months away, the anticipation starts to build, and you're just like, I can't wait anymore. It just needs to come right now. Um, and of course, you know, there's Christmas. And I kind of have this love-hate thing with Christmas because I love this time of year um, uh, leading up to Christmas, I love the anticipation. I love the the lights. I love the music. I love you know just everything that there is really about Christmas. Uh, and then you know I love Christmas Day, being with family and uh, the gift giving and everything, of course. But um, uh, then it's very sad. Like halfway through the day, like it's almost over, and then it's 365 days to wait again. And um, so in, in some ways, you know, it's, it's fun to wait and, and be part of the season. And then when, that, when it's like here, it's like it's gone now. So you kind of want to go back to the waiting, ironically, in some ways. But uh, I just have no patience for waiting. I, I can't stand it. I don't like it. Uh, and uh, many of you might be the same way. But um, nonetheless, this seems to be how God operates a lot of time. A lot of times, God makes us just simply wait. And that is most certainly true um, in the Old Testament. As we saw last week, why we need hope. Why we need hope is because of the fall. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They, uh, they listened to the serpent. They took part in the fruit from the tree that God told them not to eat from and brought sin into this world and sin has hijacked this world, has taken control, and now there's, there's entropy, there's destruction, there's death, there's brokenness, broken relationships and things. And so we are in need of hope because of how broken this world is. And God gave some hope, we saw last week. God gave us some hope when he spoke to the serpent that one will come, a seed from the woman who will crush your head as he speaks to Satan or the serpent there. And so there's this moment of hope. And the question is, how long will we have to wait for that hope? So before we dive in here, let's go to the Lord and pray and, uh, and ask that he be with us here this morning. Father, we thank you for this time that you, will, that you are with us. And as we open your word, we ask, Father, that you show us your truth. Father, that you would encourage us and that we ha- would have incredible hope. So we thank you and we praise you and it's in Jesus' name, amen. So as I mentioned, ever since that moment that God had spoken to Satan about his defeat, the world has been waiting for the incredible hope to be fulfilled. And so what we do is we fast forward from that moment in the garden to a man named Abram, about estimated 2,000 years later. As God meets with Abram for the first time, God again promises that one day all people on the earth will be blessed through him. 
So now we've come to, again, more waiting. You know, Abraham shows up. He, he seems to be a man who is, uh, he's, he's considered righteous. Uh, God credits that to him, and we think maybe, maybe, okay, this promise is gonna be fulfilled sooner rather than later. As God makes this covenant with Abram, and eventually his name is changed to Abraham. But alas, God's people must continue now to wait. So we got one step closer. Now there's a promise that through this man, Abraham, the entire world is gonna be blessed through him. So fast forward again to a man named Moses. Uh, He's the leader of Israel as they come out out of slavery in Egypt. This is again estimated probably about 540 years after Abraham. At the end of Moses' life and before a new generation enters the promised land, Moses reminds Israel of the law and also speaks to them about their future. And in Deuteronomy 18, God hints at there being a greater prophet than Moses, a greater prophet coming. It says, the Lord, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites, You must listen to him. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell everything I command him. So another hint, another another, another moment of hope where where there's going to be this one from God who's like Moses, who's greater than Moses, who will be the fulfillment of the promise of blessing through Abraham. But here again, now more waiting to do. More waiting for God's people to as he continues to hold off on bringing that incredible promise. We'll fast forward to a man named David, the king of Israel, a man after God's own heart. He's the ideal king, the king whom all other kings will be compared. He and all kings in his line uh, are the Lord's anointed. And again, David is probably about 440 years after the time of Moses. A little bit about David here. He conquers Jerusalem and makes the city the new capital of Israel. David then realizes the Ark of the Covenant is in someone's basement, and so he desires to bring it to the new capital. Uh, Things, of course, as you read that in 2 Samuel, don't go very well. And so David's kind of spooked. He believes that God's angry at him. And so he kind of sends the Ark off to someone else's house and, and just let it sit there. But after David hears that the man who's house the Ark of the Covenant is in is being blessed. He kind of realizes that God is no longer angry, and so he goes and gets it, and this time he gets it properly. Uh, If you're not aware, uh, when when, um, David goes and gets the Ark of the Covenant the first time, uh, they build a brand new ox cart. They get oxen who've never pulled anything before. They put the Ark of the Covenant on this ox cart. You know, it's beautifully made. It's wonderful. But as the oxen are bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, uh, the oxen stumble. The Ark of the Covenant uh, slips off. And out of reverence, one of the men attending the cart and attending the travel, he reaches out to touch the Ark to save it from touching the ground. And unfortunately, he lost his life for doing that. And you might be going, that doesn't seem very fair of God that that he would take this man's life for trying to keep the Ark of the Covenant from touching the ground, but God had very specific instructions. You don't touch the Ark. It's his throne. It is no one's worthy to be upon it, to touch it, to, to approach it, except for one person a year. And they have to go through a whole rigmarole in order to even get into the room that that it belongs for them to even do anything. And even then, they're still not allowed to touch it. They just sprinkle blood on the thing. And really, this is David's fault because David's telling them to go get the ark, but there's specific instructions that the ark is supposed to be put on poles and carried by the priests. So right from the very get-go, they're doing everything wrong. Anyway, so David goes and gets it back. He gets it back and they do it right the second time. They carry it into Jerusalem. They put it in a tent in which David has set up. And then we get to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 4, where David realizes something. So if you want to go there in the text, that's where we'll start. 
But that night, or excuse me, uh, let's go back to 7.1. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David. This is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies." The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne uh, of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him. As I look away from Saul, whom I remove from before you, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Well, this passage here is is quite interesting. It's, It's... a lot of different strands woven together. There's elements that belong to the immediate context uh, in terms of life right after David, but there also seems to be some aspect here that, that talks about something future. And God gives David this incredible promise that, that someone from his household will be on the throne forever. And what's incredible about this promise is that things don't seem to start off very well. David kind of looks around and looks at his palace and kind of go, wow, you know, I'm the king. I have this incredible palace. And he realizes, wait a minute, God's very throne dwells in a tent. A tent. It belongs in a palace like I'm in. And so he wants to build this incredible palace for God's throne and uh, and. So it seems that he has some very good desires. Nathan seems to affirm this until God goes and speaks to Nathan, wants Nathan, uh, the prophet Nathan, to go and tell David that, you know, who are you to build me a house? Have I ever requested to be in a building, to be in a house? I've been with you in a tent. That seems to be sufficient for me. Why do you want to build me a house? So there seems to be a little bit of chastisement here from God to David. Like, who are you to presume that I need a temple, a house? But then all of a sudden, God kind of turns the tables where it seems like this idea or this thought of David is an incredible one. And he goes and tells David, you know what? I know you want to build me a house, but I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to establish your household forever. And so here God promises David that his son will build him a house. Beyond this, God promises to David that his line will be on the throne forever. And the question is, how does David interpret this? We don't exactly know how David understands forever. Is that, does that mean that, that the kingdom of Israel will endure forever? Or there's, is there an eternal element here. 
Now from what we know of David, the things that David has written through Psalms and other things, David might have an eternal perspective when he hears this news. He understands that God is eternal. He understands that God is vast. He understands that God is the creator. And so it might be that David sees this incredible promise as something that is ultimately eternal. Well, after David uh, receives this incredible promise, we fast forward roughly 300 years and we meet some of the prophets. Now here's something that's interesting. As I was kind of putting this together, uh, timelines sometimes are really hard to, to get a grasp of in the Old Testament. Uh, I had this impression that a lot of the prophets that we know of, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and stuff, they, they come like soon after David. Like they're, they're, they're just right there next. Because when you read your, your Bible, you go from one chapter to the next and all of a sudden you're introduced, you know, during the time of the kings, you're introduced to some new kings and then all of a sudden some prophets like Elijah and, show up, uh, and people show up. But this is like years upon years after David. Like I didn't realize that Isaiah shows up 300 years after David. It's incredible. And Jeremiah even later than that. So Isaiah, he shows up 300 years after David and he tells us that, that this promise who is now starting to come into a mold and, and starting to be defined more specifically as the Messiah. Again, that is the anointed one. That is, again, the king. That's who David was. David was God's anointed one and the kings after him were God's anointed ones. And the prophets, God speaks through them and starts to really kind of develop and, and give us this incredible picture of who this promised hope is. Isaiah tells us that he's going to be someone who is rejected, that he's someone who's going to suffer and someone who's going to die. Isaiah tells us that uh, he will also be the Emmanuel, which means God with us. Isaiah also tells us that, that this promised hope this Messiah is going to be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, an Everlasting Father, a Prince of Peace. This seems to be a king who goes beyond just the throne of Israel. Isaiah continues and now connects God's promise to David of an everlasting descendant on the throne when he says, of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and forever. Again, there's the, there's the, the direct context where, where this, this future promised one, this Messiah who will sit on David's throne forever. And it can have the context of just the nation of Israel in general. But when it talks about the government and there being peace without end, uh, how, can, how can Israel have peace if the world does not have peace? And so sprinkled in the, the direct context referring to David's throne in Israel, we get a much bigger picture that this goes beyond just the nation of Israel, that this involves the entire world. Jeremiah, who, who comes at the end of, of the life of Israel slash Judah, uh, when Judah is being raided and taken down by the king of Babylon, Jeremiah, uh, he writes, of course, the book of Jeremiah. He also writes Lamentations. He's watching the destruction. He's watching the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, Zion, the capital, the place where God said he would put his name forever. So Jeremiah again comes about 400 years after the time of David and he talks about there being a new covenant. A new covenant that God is going to make. And the question is with this new covenant, who's going to be the new mediator? And then you look at the new mediator, what do you think? You think Moses. And you come back to Deuteronomy 18 where Moses says that there will be one who will be greater than him, a prophet like him who will speak for 
God. It's crazy. If you, if you really pay attention to these things, you're going to see how they're all connected, that, that God has this incredible plan that He is working out. As you take a survey of all the different prophets, Daniel, Ezekiel, Amos, uh, Habakkuk, all the prophets hint at or speak of the one who will be anointed by God, that is the Messiah. And of course, the Old Testament closes with the prophet Malachi, who is about 600 years after David and 300 years after Isaiah. And he too hints at the coming of God's appearing in Jesus. So there's all this anticipation. You have the close of the Old Testament with the nation of Israel kind of going, okay, we've waited so long. Do we have to wait now more? And for about 400 years, God is completely silent. There's no prophet. There's no one who speaks on behalf of God. So the Old Testament closes with this anticipation. Okay, when's this promised one that we heard all the way back in Genesis who was promised through Abraham? who was promised to come after Moses. This this anointed one who's going to sit on David's throne forever. When, When will this happen? So much anticipation for God's promise of the Messiah. But at this point, there's still nothing to do other than wait. And of course, fast forward over those 400 years of silence after the prophet of Malachi Something incredible happens. And we're going to talk about that next week. So for now, as we kind of look at this passage, look at what God has been doing through the entire Old Testament, making people wait, throughout Scripture, God speaks of His patience. Peter says here, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. God's patience seems to be a good thing. God waiting seems to be good. We might hate waiting, but God seems to be okay with it. God's patience is a good thing. Peter also says, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. So for me, throughout this week, something that I've been reflecting on, something I've been learning is that waiting is really sometimes, a lot of the time, a good thing. Yes, it can be frustrating and hard, this pandemic, waiting for these pews to be filled again, waiting for people to get back here. It's frustrating. It's hard. It can be miserable at times. But yet at the same time, if we change our perspective, waiting can build anticipation. Waiting builds perseverance. As James says, James 1, you know, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials because going through those trials builds perseverance and that perseverance has its what? Perfect result. And waiting definitely builds perseverance. But I think also, waiting builds hope. There's always hope found in God's promises, no matter how long we might have to wait. The Old Testament was pro- uh, promised us an incredible hope, and they had to wait a long time for that hope to come. In the end though, As we're going to see next week, God delivers on His promises and the wait will come to an end. But of course, as we sit here today, we have the privilege of looking back. However, like them, we are yet waiting. That incredible hope of Jesus Christ, His birth, Him coming into the world, Him sacrificing His life to rescue ours by dying on the cross, we get to look back at that. But there are some incredible promises that Jesus gave us. Some have been fulfilled and come, but we are still waiting for the ultimate fulfillment. 
were waiting for him to come back. And God seems to be okay with us waiting, just as he made his people wait for Jesus. We wait for his return. So, our response, what should it be? It should be waiting with anticipation. How glorious is it after a long wait sometimes, how much more enjoyable something is when you wait and persevere? And of course, perseverance shapes us. Perseverance molds us. Perseverance is what gets us to the end of the race. And so let us continue to persevere and let us continue to have that incredible hope because that hope is rooted in God's promises. We saw Him fulfill it in Christ to all those that He spoke to in the Old Testament. He's now spoken to us through the apostles, and we eagerly wait. So let us continue to have that incredible hope that rests in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this time that we can be together. Even though we're apart and at home, we have the incredible hope of Your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank You that You Give us this hope. Help us to anticipate with great expectation. Let us persevere as we wait. and Let us continue to hope and find joy in that. We thank You and we praise You. And it's in Jesus' name, Amen.